Oral, oral questions, the Honourable Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, there are new revelations this morning regarding the Fisheries Minister. Oh, no. According to a report in the Globe and Mail, Chief Terence Paul and the member to First Nation were informed by the Minister that they needed to partner with a company run by the Liberal MP's brother in order to win a surf clam license. Simple question. Are the media reports true? Did the Minister of Finance or anyone acting on his behalf suggest to the member two First Nations that they needed to make a deal with the premium seafoods company in order to win this bid? Wow. Yeah. Honourable Minister of Fisheries. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for a question. Uh, that allegation is simply false. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what's more important also uh, is the decision our government made to include Indigenous nations in this lucrative offshore fishery. It is a historic decision. We had a public process, Mr. Speaker, very similar to the one uh, the former Conservative government had to consult industry and Indigenous groups about participating in this fishery. And we think that was a positive process, and we think it's a positive decision to include Indigenous people in this fishery. Opposition House Leader. Well, we know the Liberals decided to include their friends and family in this, for sure. But Mr. Speaker, the Fisheries Minister decided to take surf clam quota away from Clearwater Seafood and give it to a company with connections to his own family and a company being run by a sitting Liberal MP's brother. To make matters worse, the company that he gave the license to had the lowest percentage of Indigenous ownership of all the bidders, and they didn't even have a vote. Clearly, the fix was in. Will the minister do the right thing and restart this bidding process? Minister of Fisheries. Mr. Speaker, no uh, matter how often my honourable friend repeats the same incorrect allegations, it will not make them true. Uh, to say that I have a family member that will benefit uh, from this decision is entirely false, and she knows that. I would draw her attention to the statement made by Chief Sock uh, on the Elsie Buktuk uh, Nation website. He has been very clear. I do not have a family member who will benefit from this process, and she should be more careful before making up those allegations and repeating them when she knows it's not true. Honourable Opposition House Leader. Just another in the latest long list of liberal ethical standards. The Prime Minister scandal, scandals. The Prime Minister under investigation. The Minister of Finance under investigation. The Liberal MP for Brampton East was under investigation. Now the Fisheries Minister under formal investigation. There are new serious allegations being reported, and this Minister's credibility is in tatters. No one honestly believes that the deal was above board. It has liberal corruption all over it. So, Mr. Speaker, if the Minister won't do the right thing and reset the process, will the Prime Minister remove him from this file? Honourable Minister of Fisheries. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, obviously, if the Ethics Commissioner has questions or concerns or would like uh, any documents with respect to this process, we are, of course, happy to comply uh, and happy to have those conversations with the Ethics Commissioner or his staff. I would remind my honourable friend again, Mr. Speaker, uh, it is important to stick to the facts. The facts are we had an open process to consult industry and Indigenous communities. Their process, Mr. Speaker, which was very similar to ours, forgot to include Indigenous communities. So we made a decision, Mr. Speaker, to begin, to begin the conversation. Honourable Member for the Ville of Pignan, Mr. Speaker, the, these, this government uh, is a fishing party that's continuing to be expended. They have goodies for everyone, uncles, cousins, liberal friends. Mr. Speaker, when did the Prime Minister learn that the Minister of Fisheries family would benefit from this very lucrative contract. Mr. President, I understand that my Mr. Speaker, I understand that my honourable colleague wanted to repeat in French the preceding question. That changed nothing with respect to the facts. I have explained in French and in English that no member of my family nor the 60 cousins of my spouse have benefited from this process. So I feel it irresponsible to continue to repeat these falsehoods. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, 
With Liberals, the only thing that is clear and transparent is the Prime Minister's selfie lens. Favoritism, breach of contract, deception, all that's missing is kickbacks with respect to the Minister of Fisheries. When will the Prime Minister, when did the Prime Minister learn that the Minister's family was going to benefit from this lucrative contract? And why is the Prime Minister defending the indefendable? Monsieur, Monsieur Président, le pre Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister did not learn these false allegations. He only heard them in this chamber. The Prime Minister was very clear. Our government is decided to open a commercial fishery, a high seas uh, fishery to the indigenous people. And this is to help communities and indigenous communities, something the Conservatives forgot to do when they decided to add participants to this fishery some years ago. The Honourable Member for Bertie Mosquinonger. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General is clear. The Liberals have no plan to eliminate subsidies for fossil fuels. And how does the government defend this? They discredit the work of the Auditor General. They say anything at all. So what is their plan? What is the total amount of subsidies to fossil fuels? And can they, can they tell us, will they cut these subsidies by 2019? And can they tell us how much money they're going to give to Kinder Morgan? Mr. Speaker, what is their plan? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to phasing out subsidies to fossil fuels between now and 2020. We're on the right track. At the same time, we know that the Trans Mountain expansion is extremely important for our country and our economy, and this is why we're working with the company to find a solution for the pipeline expansion. This is very important. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All back to Paris, Mr. Speaker. It was December 2015, and a shiny new Prime Minister from Canada put his hand on his chest and promised the world that Canada would end the subsidies to the big oil and gas companies. Fast forward to today, that same Prime Minister beats his chest as he not only keeps the subsidies in place, he's actually adding on indemnification for the Kinder Morgan pipeline proposal. So Canadians and the world want to know, what happened to that guy? Where's the support for the green, clean jobs of tomorrow? And when are they going to finally keep their commitment and end the subsidy to big oil and big gas? Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we have committed to phasing out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies between now and 2020, 2025. We're on track to do that. In fact, we've taken measures to do that in Budget 2016. What I can say is at the same time, we want to make sure that we can move forward with a pipeline expansion that's in the best interests of our country. We know that the environment and the economy can go hand in hand. That's exactly what we're doing by taking a commercial approach to finding a way to have that pipeline project go forward without having any subsidy in place in any way. The Honourable Member for Skeena Bulkley Valley. They, they say they're committed, Mr. Speaker, but I'm committed to having a luscious full head of hair, and it's not happening either. <laughs> so I'm wondering when the Liberals are actually going to do something about it. You know, there's a lot of things that we disagree about in this place, and we should. Yet there's one thing that we should never disagree about, and that's how Canadians vote in our elections. The way Canadians vote is sacred and a foundation of our democracy. It's not a right or a left issue, it's right and wrong. And it was wrong when Stephen Harper forced through the Unfair Elections Act through Parliament. And it's wrong when Liberals do the exact same thing. So my question to the government is simple. Will they commit today, yes or no, to not move any changes to our elections laws without multi-party... The Honourable Minister of Democratic Institutions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am incredibly proud of Bill C-76, and I am delighted that it is going to, for the Procedures and House Affairs Committee so that it can get the study and the, uh, uh, the, study and the uh, interrogation that it deserves. I'm looking forward to the uh, members opposite asking questions of witnesses to ensure that we encourage Canadians to participate in our democracy, to encourage young Canadians to be registered for elections, to ensure that Canadians living abroad Canadians without identification can have a vote.
vouching and can use their voter identification card to ensure that every single Canadian has the right to vote, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for berthier maskinonge Mr. Speaker, we're all here to represent our fellow citizens and to make their voices heard here in Ottawa. But do the Liberals realize what they're doing when they limit debate on the electoral legislation? Do they understand the irony of the situation? Refusing debate in a democracy means refusing the democratic practice. By acting with the Conservatives in 2014, they're insulting Canadians. Aren't they even aware of this, Mr. Speaker? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm eager uh, about uh, working with my colleagues because we can reverse the changes made by the previous government and we can make sure that all Canadians who have a right to vote can vote. We want to make sure that Canadians will be registered when they're 18 years of age. I am looking forward to working with my colleagues in order to improve Canadian democracy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the Liberals have brought forward these major changes to our electoral laws, and these are changes that would tip the electoral scales in their favour. And I don't know if there's any legislation that could be more significant, because after only one hour of debate, they moved notice for time allocation. As the Liberal member for Costa Bay stated, if we're going to actually be debating any changes to the Elections Act, time allocation and closure need not apply. So if the Liberals actually respected Canadians, they'd let this legislation receive property debate. So why are the Liberals disrespecting Canadians and trying to ram this bill through? Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to respond for my colleague from the Conservatives because we are in fact making it easier for Canadians to vote. We are clamping down on those who maliciously thwart and interfere in our electoral process. And let's contrast that, Mr. Speaker, with the Conservatives who in government made it tougher for Canadians to vote. From robocalls to Dean Del Mastro participated in schemes to maliciously thwart the electoral process. This is also the party who had to pay $250,000 in fines for breaking electoral laws, Mr. Speaker. Right. We will take no lessons from the, the Conservatives when it comes to our democracy. The Honourable Member, order. The Member for Niagara Centre will come to order. Alors. Order, please. This could shorten things. Let's not do that. The Honourable Member, everyone loves question, please. The Honourable Member for Banff, Airdrie. Well, things that, speaking about things that are broken, Mr. Speaker, how about all the broken Liberal promises? Yeah. Canadians clearly can't trust this Prime Minister. Nope. And if he won't uh, keep the word of his own backbenchers, maybe he'll listen to the Parliamentary Secretary, to the Leader of the Government. When he said the government, by once again relying on a time allocation motion to get its agenda passed, speaks of incompetence. It speaks of a genuine lack of respect for parliamentary procedure and ultimately for Canadians. It continues to try to prevent members of parliament from being engaged in representing their constituents here in the House of Commons. So to the Prime Minister, why the hypocrisy? The member opposite wants to talk about broken. Let's talk about broken rules, Mr. Speaker. With C-76, our government is making it easier for Canadians to vote and toughen sanctions for those who break the rules. The defeated Harper Conservatives, on the other hand, made it tougher for Canadians to vote, and they broke the rules. We will not be taking lessons from the Harper Conservatives who paid a $250,000 fine for breaking those rules, Mr. Speaker, who used robocalls to send people to the wrong polls, and whose parliamentary secretary for the Prime Minister went to jail. Mr. Speaker, thank you. The Honourable Member for Montbagnier, the Lake, Borasca, Rivière du Loup. Mr. Speaker, when the Conservatives wanted to improve our election system in order to ensure its integrity, we were allowed 84 hours of debate. But when the Liberals introduced Bill C 76 to torque elections in their favour, they brought in time allocation limited debate to have and had it voted on yesterday after only two hours of debate. What are the Liberals afraid of? Why such a rush? Are they afraid of losing the next election? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, but I believe my colleague across the way is thinking of C-23 of the preceding government. In this bill, C-57, we will deal with people who contravene our electoral pr process. 
This, contrary to the conservatives who allowed for robocalling and other kinds of processes that thwarted the electoral process, we have no lessons to learn from the conservatives. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, a voter card is not a piece of ID. Many of them are in the recycle bin and Elections Canada admitted that in 2015 more than 400,000 cards had errors. In Quebec, voters are already used to presenting a health insurance card, a driver's license, a Canadian passport, a Canadian forces card. Do the Liberals think they can tell a certain class of citizens that they are excluded from the list? To the Minister, Mr. Speaker. There were thousands of Canadians who couldn't vote in the last ele election because of rules brought in by the last government. It is the Conservatives who are afraid of Canadians voting. On our side of the House, we want to empower Canadians to vote. We know we want to make sure every Canadian who has the right can vote. The Innisfil. When the Prime Minister said there was something about basic dictatorships he liked, he wasn't kidding. And once again, he's proving that statement to be at the core of everything he is and everything he represents. We now know that someone has ordered Elections Canada to implement this bill before Parliament has passed it. Our democratic system belongs to Canadians, Canadians who elect us to this place. They expect legislation to be debated before it's enacted. They expect due process. Yeah. Will the Prime Minister instruct Elections Canada to halt the implementation of this bill until Parliament passes the amended version? On this side of the House, unlike the opposite, we are not afraid of Elections Canada. In fact, that's why in this bill we have given the Commissioner of Elections Canada the power to compel testimony, that's something right. that may have come, into, come in handy when dealing with robocalls. We have also given the Commissioner of Elections Canada the power to lay charges because, Mr. Speaker, we also believe that working with Elections Canada is important, which is why we are implementing over 85 per cent of the recommendations from the CEO of Elections Canada should this bill pass. I I hope that my colleagues on the other side would do this because it's right for democracy. Thank you. A member for Barry Innisfil. Well, it looks like Gerald Butts has found another ventriloquist act to perform with, Mr. Speaker. Where are they now, Mr. Speaker? Where are the great defenders of democracy from the Liberal side? And what do they say now? Nothing. We now know that the Prime Minister ordered Elections Canada to implement this bill before it passed Parliament. If that isn't rigging our elect election system in their favour, I don't know what is. So I ask again. Will the Prime Minister instruct Elections Canada to halt the implementation of this bill until Parliament passes the amended version? Honourable Minister of Democratic Institutions. Sir, as a woman in politics, I take umbrage yes. with the fact that he is saying that I am not speaking on behalf of myself and behalf yeah, of the really. government. That is It is not this side of the House that had the parliamentary secretary to the Prime Minister who went to jail. We on this side are doing what's necessary for democracy, which is why in this bill, 85% of the recommendations from the CEO from 2015 are represented. Let's do what's right for democracy, all of us. In Order. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. The Liberals have offered to fully protect Kinder Morgan while Canadians bear all the financial and environmental risks. Now we have learned that the Infrastructure Bank and the CPP Investment Board may offer up Canadian pension money to backstop this pipeline expansion. Canadian taxpayers should not have to foot the bill for oil and gas subsidies. This is corporate welfare that the Liberals promised to end. The gig is up. Will the Prime Minister just admit that he has completely abandoned his promise to end subsidies to big oil? Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to reinforce our commitment to end subsidies to oil, uh, oil organizations of any sort by 2025. We're on track to do that. What I can tell you is that we are working hard. 
We are in discussions with Kinder Morgan, the proponent for the Trans Mountain Expansion Pipeline. We know this project is in the best interests of Canada, best interests of Canadians from a standpoint of jobs and our overall economy. We will work to do this in a way that is commercially appropriate, in a way that does not create any subsidies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Belleuil Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, this was a Liberal commitment in uh, 2015, but more than two-thirds of Canadians want subsidies to uh, fossil fuel stopped. The Liberals did promise to do it hand on heart, but they have no plan. It was just hot air, maybe in 10 years. Now, Mr. Speaker, things are even worse because now they are going to be investing more money in the industry by indemnifying Kinder Morgan. The Honourable Finance Minister, Mr. Speaker, the truth is, is that we are committed to phasing out ineffective subsidies to uh, fossil fuels between now and 2020. We announced it in our first budget, and we have already uh, made progress in Budget 2017. We have tax credits. We ended tax credits. We will have a solution. We're looking at a solution for the future. But right now, we have to act for our economy. The Honourable Member for beauport Moiru. Mr. Speaker, the International Organization of Francophonie is funded by Canadian taxpayers. But in the last year, the world over, we've heard about the problems with budgetary management by Mikhail Jean. Madame Jean has refused to be transparent. And what's worse, other scandals are beginning to make the headlines. Can this government explain its support for renewing Madame Jean's renewed candidacy in October? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, Madame Jean has done excellent work in carrying out her mandate and in uh, demonstrating the values that are important to us, defense of human rights, defense of women, defense of young people. The Franco Francophonie needs an update of its financial processes, and we're, we are looking at that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, this is not a question of chauvinism. It's a question of taxpayers' money. The government has been very nonchalant when it comes to taxpayers' money. But it's not surprising that the Liberals want to renew her candidacy because they manage their budget the same way. Can they show anything that could restore confidence in Madame Jean? Can they at least ask her to explain and give an account of her action? The Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker, we are following up on every dollar that is invested by this government, and especially with respect to international assistance. Through the Francophonie, through this organization, we help some of the most vulnerable, some of the poorest, especially in Francophone Africa, in Haiti. We help women. We help young people. We can be proud of what we do through this organization, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, only Liberals could be proud of Mikhail Jean is doing. She's become an embarrassment for Canada. She's been completely irresponsible in her management. She's doing exactly what the Liberal government is doing, spending as if there were no tomorrow. Even France wants to withdraw its support for Madame Jean. How can the government, the Liberal government, continue to defend the indefensible? The Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker, once again, I had the opportunity to travel in certain Francophone countries to meet with my counterparts, and there is great support for Mikhail Jean, a Canadian who is doing outstanding work in the organization. Mr. Speaker, there are things that can be improved financial management rules, and we will be helping Madame Jean and the organization to do so. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. 
the a uh, the auditor general is clear. Fifty million dollars. Madame Jean has spent two million for two year for two years uh, traveling over two years. Order, please. Je Je dois rappeler à l'honorable député. I'd like to remind the honorable member to direct his questions to the chair. The honorable member for Louis Saint Laurent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know that you are a responsible man, not like this government. We learned that uh, Madame Jean rented a limousine for. for traveling 500 meters. Her husband used the limousine for personal reasons. One million dollars for something else. Uh, w once again, I would like the honorable member to address this question to me. Now can, he can continue. Now the minister can continue with her answer. Mr. Speaker, there are rules in place, and they should be reviewed in order that they be acceptable today, and we will be working closely with the administration and the uh, Secretary General, General in, to make sure that the standards are acceptable. But Madame Jean did respect the rules, according to the information I have, and I'm happy to support her renewed candidacy. Mr. Speaker, Canada and the United States are renegotiating the Columbia River Treaty a 54-year-old agreement that has had tremendous impact on communities in the Columbia River Basin, including three First Nations. But last week, the government told those First Nations that they would be excluded from the talks, despite the massive effects that treaty has had on their territories. Shame. So why has this government excluded the First Nations from the talks, and what happened to the government's commitment to a new nation-to-nation -nation relationship? Here, here. Good question. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for Canada U.S. Relations. Mr. Speaker, our objectives in, in these negotiations to ensure that the Columbia River Treaty continues to be mutually beneficial for both Canada and the United States. And we've been working very closely with the British Columbian authorities, the First Nations up and down its length, and the stakeholders to ensure that all interests are heard, represented, and addressed in these negotiations. We will also address environmental considerations and the interests of First Nations and aim to renew this agreement for the 21st century. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Abitibi Bay James Nunavikiu. Mr. Speaker, First Nations' rights are protected under the Constitution and at the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. When the Columbia River Treaty was signed in 1964, those very nations were excluded from the negotiations. Now. The agreement will be renegotiated, and they're being told that they'll be once again ignored and excluded from the process. Why, Mr. Speaker? Why? I ask you. Is it because uh, this government's most important relations is with the Aboriginal peoples? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our objective is to ensure that this benefit is continues to be mutually beneficial for Canada and the U.S. We are working in close cooperation with British Columbia. First Nations and stakeholders to ensure that the interests of all are taken into account in these negotiations. We will also address environmental concerns and ensure they are in the interest of our First Nations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. North Centre. Mr. Speaker, the serious crisis in Myanmar is a tragedy that requires an urgent response. The humanitarian situation is precarious, with camps and settlements vulnerable to flooding and landslides during the monsoon season. Congested living conditions continue to increase the risk of disease outbreaks, and more Rohingya are crossing the border into Bangladesh every day. Can the Minister of International Development and La Francophonie update this House on Canada's latest initiatives to respond to this terrible situation? Well, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. London North Centre for its support to vulnerable populations. Yesterday, I was happy to be alongside my colleague, the Minister for International Affairs, uh, to uh, unveil our plan. It's $300 million over three years to address humanitarian development, peace and stabilization needs in Myanmar and Bangladesh. Support to host communities in Bangladesh to mitigate the impact of the crisis and to build self-reliance and resilience, and a central emphasis on the needs of women and girls. Thank you.
The Honourable Member for Belchester's Echemen Levy. Mr. Speaker, now, in the magical world of bunnies and rainbows for the Prime Minister, there are no problems, but he created one big one with his careless tweet, Welcome to Canada. Now, brochures are being distributed freely in Plattsburgh, explaining how to enter the Canada, enter Canada and circumvent the border. What a waste. In, instead of sending ministers to Nigeria, they just have to cross the border, go to Le Col, to dot the I's and cross the T's. Under the Liberals, the border is a sieve. What are they doing to plug the holes in it? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we acknowledge that, that there is a great deal of misinformation among migrant communities, and that's why we continue to make people aware of the situation. Coming to Canada is not a free ride to being accepted as an asylum seeker. It's important to communicate all necessary information. And that is why our government contacted the Plattsburgh Care Group to inform them of the very well-established criteria for applying for asylum. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals are putting more money into a black hole because they aren't uh, turning off the tap. There's nothing to stop this illegal influx of people. While taxpayers wait at the airport and the lines get longer, what is the Prime Minister doing to stop this influx of illegal migrants across the border? Mr. Speaker, we have contacted the organization to, uh, to uh, allow them to learn uh, the comprehensive nature of our immigration and asylum systems. The Consul General in uh, New York will also provide them with more uh, information on all the uh, uh, issues surrounding regular migration to Canada. We have uh, an aggressive outreach campaign that has been ongoing since last year that has been appreciated by organizations and, uh, and diaspora communities in the United States. It's having an impact. We'll continue uh, that outreach campaign, and we are seeing uh, a lot of results with respect to that campaign. Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. The minister just said that his plan to deal with his choice to functionally erase the Canadian border is to divert illegal border crossers from Toronto. Last week, the plan was to divert them from Quebec to Toronto. Why is the minister playing a shell game with human beings instead of closing the loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement there and restoring compassion and order to Canada's immigration system? Yeah, yeah. Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, our record speaks for itself. Yeah. If, you look at, if you look at the record that the Harper Conservatives had, uh, they kept families apart for years. They kept living caregivers uh, up, uh, from five to seven years away from uh, reuni reuniting with their families. They kept refugee numbers very low. They, uh, they uh, cut refugee health care, which, which our federal courts call cruel and unusual punishment. Mr. Speaker, irony is lost on the Conservative Party. The Honourable Member for Markham Unionville. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the City of Toronto announced it would be opening two emergency centres to deal with arrival of illegal migrants in the city. Mayor John Tory has made it clear that he will have to take extreme measures if, there, if more isn't done to stop the redirected Quebec migrants. We have a city in a state of crisis. When will the Minister finally close the loophole in the safe third country agreement? Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, we have, under the Harper Conservatives, they kept families apart for years. They kept living caregivers apart from their family for years. They have recently discovered their compassion for refugees by lecturing us on, on refugees when they cut health care for refugees. They have recently discovered the importance of immigration processing when they kept families apart for years, Mr. Speaker. They had no idea that uh, investment follows talent, Mr. Speaker. Under their watch, talent used to take seven months to get to Canada. Under our watch, it takes two weeks to get to Canada. We're proud of our record. Hello. I've heard quite a bit from the honourable member for Abbotsford today, but he hasn't had the floor. I'd ask him to not interrupt when someone else is speaking. The honourable member for Saint Saint Bagot. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the minister saw that once again the Liberals at committee refused to vote on a motion proposing to hear from experts, people who are sick, 
on the issue of increasing EI sickness benefits. In 2016, the Prime Minister and the Minister said they would be resolving the issue within a year. Two years later, people who are sick are still facing financial problems. Too many people. What's the problem? The question is simple. Will the Minister keep his word, yes or no? The Honourable Mem Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, I did have an opportunity to participate in the proceedings of the committee, and I thanked uh, the committee for the important work that has led to very uh, clear advice to put forth a strategy for the government. And I also talked about this considerable investment that has been invested in uh, parental benefits for caregivers in the sickness benefits and improvements to EI that benefit uh, thousands of Canadians. And it's on that basis, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we are going to continue to work hard to improve living conditions and support conditions under the EI program. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One year has passed now since uh, Churchill lost its rail line and became a fly-in only community. The closure of the rail line and the port has hurt the entire north. The fact is Churchill residents don't have time for a years-long legal, legal battle with Omnitrax to end. They need a deal to get the line back up and running now. In fact, they needed it a long time ago, Mr. Speaker. And after a year, the Liberal government has failed to broker a deal that will restore the line. So on behalf of Northern Manitobans and all those concerned to see them succeed, I'd like to ask when exactly they can expect a deal to get the line back on track. Yeah. Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, our, our government continues to be committed to the people of Churchill and Northern Manitoba. And as you know, our chief negotiator has been working with potential buyers of the, of the line, and we are working also with Indigenous communities and other stakeholders. We are optimistic that we will find an operator to take care of this very important line, and as soon as we are in a position to uh, finalize that, we'll let everyone know. The Honourable Member for Carleton Trail, Eagle Creek. Well, Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is that until this week, a company called I Churchill Inc. was in the process of finalizing an agreement to buy, rebuild and reopen the Hudson Bay Railway and the Port of Churchill. This agreement included a majority ownership stake for Manitoba First Nations. But for some reason, the Liberals decided to intervene and block this agreement. Why? Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, as I say, and let me repeat it again, we are 100 per cent committed to the people of northern Manitoba and of Churchill, and we are going to make sure that this line is rebuilt. At the moment, our chief negotiator is working with all interested parties. We are optimistic that we will find a solution, and as soon as we have one, we will let everyone know. Honourable Member for Carleton Trail, Eagle Creek. Mr. Speaker, when the Liberals announced their intention to support new ownership, they laid out three criteria. A, a reasonable price for the sale, B, support from First Nations, and C, a, vi a viable business plan. I, Churchill, believes they met all three of these criteria, but the Liberals rejected this deal with no explanation. Shame. Instead, the Liberals are only willing to deal with one specific company, uh -oh. a Toronto-based financial firm. Uh -oh. Why? Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, I am not going to go into details about negotiating, but I can assure you that our chief negotiator is working with all serious partners in this venture. And when we have a decision, we will let everyone know about it. Of a member for Kamloops, Thompson, Caribou. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the government took our advice and declined to allow the sale of Acon yes. to a Chinese state-owned enterprise. But in spite of numerous other requests, they have arrogantly refused to do the same due diligence in terms of Anbang and our senior care facilities. As we now know, Anbang has collapsed, the chairman was arrested, and our seniors homes are owned by Communist China. Will the minister now commit to fixing the Anbang mess? Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for her question. Our government is open to investment from other countries. Uh, we encourage this because it creates good middle-class jobs. We do it, Mr. Speaker, though, with careful uh, consideration, depending on the kind of process and the kind of investment, as the decision yesterday proved. We will never compromise our national security. With respect to cedar tree and retirement concepts, Mr. Speaker, there are guarantees that are put into place 
Those guarantees are being followed and monitored in particular by the provincial government of British Columbia, and we'll continue to monitor that situation to make sure that engagements are kept. Honourable Member for Markham Thornhill. I was, Mr. Speaker, I was very proud when in April of 2017 our government introduced Bill C-46, legislation with the ultimate goal of reducing the significant number of death and injuries caused by impaired driving, a crime that continues to claim innocent lives and wreak havoc and devastation on Canadian families. This legislation includes mandatory alcohol screening, which I understand will significantly deter those individuals who continue to put others at risk by driving impaired by alcohol. Can the Minister please provide the House with an update on the legislation? Well, Minister of Justice. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Markham Thornhill for the question. One of the key elements of Bill C-46 is mandatory alcohol screening, which is in use in over 40 countries worldwide, including Australia and Ireland. Our government was very disappointed last night when Conservatives voted to remove mandatory alcohol screening. Uh, we agree with MAD Canada that mandatory alcohol screening saves lives and is a fundamental piece of moving forward on impaired driving and tackling impaired driving. Mr. Speaker, we need this life-saving measure right now. Order. The Honourable Member for St. Albert Edmonton. The Chinese Communist regime is bullying and threatening airlines, including Air Canada, with the outrageous demand that they change their designation from Taiwan to Taiwan, China. The U.S. administration has rightfully called these demands Orwellian. By contrast, the Liberals have been silent in the face of a foreign government dictating terms to a Canadian company. When will the Liberals stand up to Beijing's bullying? Mr. Speaker, Air Canada is a private company and responsible for its own uh, website content and its own negotiations. Canada's long-standing position on this issue has not changed. The Honourable Member for Windsor Tecumseh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, over two years ago, at an event that I hosted, the Foreign Affairs Minister of the Day, Stephen Dion, came to the event and announced that the optional protocol for the Convention Against Torture would no longer be optional. Well, it's two years later, nothing's happened, and I'd like to reiterate that torture is abhorrent, it's illegal, and it flies in the face of all of the international norms and conventions that we have committed to. So, when will the government finally stand unequivocally against torture and ratify and implement the OPCAT? Uh, Mr. Speaker, this government's uh, primary consideration in all its international engagements is the upholding of human rights, and we agree with the member opposite that torture is abhorrent and should not be used. Uh, uh, ratifying and acceding to these optional protocols, as with many conventions internationally, requires significant conversations with both provincial authorities and other entities and stakeholders right across the country, and that work continues to take place uh, within Global Affairs Canada, across the Government of Canada, with our partners right across this country. Thank you. Honourable Member for St. John Rossi. Many Canadians are currently affected by the flooding in my riding of St. John Rossi, all of New Brunswick and British Columbia. I personally witnessed the impact of the floods on families, businesses, and first responders who are working 24-7 for their community. This year, some of these courageous people may find themselves unable to file or pay taxes on time. Those people shouldn't be penalized. Can the Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of, of National Revenue inform this House on the actions that CRA is taking to support affected Canadians? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague from St. Joe Rossi for this important question and acknowledge the important work members from New Brunswick and BC have been doing in response to this natural disaster. Our government recognizes the difficulties faced by Canadians affected by flooding in New Brunswick and BC, and we are committed to help reduce that burden. We understand that natural disasters may cause hardship for taxpayers whose primary concern during this time are their families, their homes and communities, and those affected are encouraged to make 
a request to CRA for taxpayer relief either online or simply by calling the CRA. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister called for an independent investigation into events in Gaza, presumably because he lacks confidence in Israel's domestic mechanisms for self-assessment. But when a Canadian citizen was killed in an Iranian prison, the government said that they wanted the Iranian government to investigate itself. So which justice system does the government regard as more credible to undertake neutral self-assessment, Israel's or Iran's? Honourable wow. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, while the Conservatives shamefully try to turn Canada's support for Israel into a partisan issue, I will repeat the long-standing position of consecutive governments of Canada, both Liberal and Conservative, that Canada is a steadfast friend of Israel and friend of the Palestinian people. Mr. Speaker, Hamas has been designated as a terrorist organization since 2002, and that's a position our government continues to hold. We strongly condemn its culture of violence, its threats towards Israel, and its acts of terrorism. And our call for an investigative uh, an investigation into the situation in Gaza includes uh, reports of incitement by Hamas. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, asylum seekers arriving in Plattsburgh receive a user's guide on how to illegally cross the border, a brochure explaining how to get to Roxham Road, how, it costs, how much it costs in by taxi, who to call in Montreal, and how things unfold. Now, for weeks, the minister has been aware of all of this. And what is he doing? What's he done? Made a call. I'm impressed by such a, such a, an energetic response that will change things. Does he think we're fools? Oh. The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, we know that there's a great deal of misinformation in circulation among migrant communities. And that's why we started an awareness campaign some time ago in the United States. Applying for asylum in Canada doesn't mean some will enter the country we need to ensure that everyone understands that they need to go to before an independent uh, tribunal, the IRB. We've been in contact with the organization called Plattsburgh Care to make them aware of the realities uh, surrounding an a, a demand for asylum. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. Mr. Speaker. Ottawa is preparing to take in more asylum seekers, and the Americans are setting up to send us more, and never through legal channels. And why is this? Because the government refuses to suspend the safe third country agreement. Instead of encouraging people to enter illegally, instead of tr sending ministers to Africa, would the minister take responsibility to do his job and settle this problem with the U.S. authorities? Mr. Speaker, we're working on several fronts on this very important issue to deal with asylum seekers, and we'll continue to do so. We will be meeting next week, and we'll continue the work of the ad hoc committee made up of federal ministers, provincial ministers as well, and we are working and in discussions with the U.S. We need to work on several fronts on this important issue. Deputy de Saanich, Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the first member of parliament to raise the issue of the ACON sale in this place, I am enormously gratified that the government of Canada has decided to stop the takeover of ACON by the People's Republic of China. But I'm very worried because there is the Canada-China Investment Treaty. The People's Republic of China can complain about anything, anytime, in secret. Can the government commit to full transparency if the People's Republic of China complains of a Canadian decision? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Ministry of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Leader of the Green Party for her question. Uh, indeed, uh, we relied on our, on our security agencies in the multi-step review process, and we, we came to a decision which we think is the right one. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we will uh, use all legitimate uh, and uh, legal means to contest any contestation of that decision, to defend Canada's right under, the, under our Act, and, and that is the commitment that I would make to the Honourable Member right now. And now I believe the Honourable Opposition House Leader has the usual Thursday question. Thank you very much.